Hello, welcome to The Big Fight. Well, this week has been dominated by a lot of news coming out of Maldives. Exactly what is happening, it seems to be almost like a coup by the president, really shutting up the opposition, arresting members of the Supreme Court. Maldives has been in the headlines. We've also had a lot of headlines around Pakistan. And every time Pakistan does something, obviously it makes a lot of the headlines. But one of the issues that perhaps doesn't quite get the attention that it deserves is something that many experts feel lies behind a lot of what is happening, and that is the continuing consolidation of Chinese power and Chinese influence in the entire region around India. Now, you have, of course, heard of the string of pearls, and it's been spoken about for five years, seven years, a decade, perhaps even more. But look at some of the recent events and look at what's been happening in our entire neighborhood. And if eyebrows aren't being raised and if alarm bells aren't yet ringing, perhaps it's time that this should start to ring. So just look what's been happening around us. Take a look at Nepal. Very clearly seems to be moving more and more into under Chinese influence and anybody's guess as to where this entire process is going to start off. And we will, during the course of the big fight today, raise, take a look at some of the worrying developments in Nepal over the recent time. Go to Bangladesh. It's been a really close ally of India under Sheikh Hasina, despite whatever is happening on the question of democracy. But Chinese influence rising out there, all sorts of talks about trade and what's going to happen and the rest of it. But Bangladesh pales uh, when, you when, when you consider what's happening further south. Uh, when you look at Sri Lanka, again, there was a lot of happiness in India when Sri Sena came. We said, okay, he's really close to India and a, and a close ally, but indebtedness has forced him to take certain steps. Hambantota has gone to China. Now you have a Chinese port just south of India. What does that do to our long-term security? It's a 99-year lease. Um, of course, we know about what's been happening further away. As we know about Djibouti, where there is a Chinese naval base coming up. And Pakistan, well, for all practical purposes, Pakistan's almost starting to look like a bit like a Chinese satellite right now, and perhaps has been for a long time. And you're going to have a Chinese base there in Gwadar. All of which should start making India feel just a little bit claustrophobic. There's a lot of Chinese influence all around us. And now, add the Maldives to that particular mix. Uh, the Maldives may say that they first tried to send an envoy to India, but the fact of the matter is that they have sent an envoy to China and to Pakistan and to Saudi Arabia, none of them countries that are necessarily particularly favorably you know, inclined towards India. So what does this mean? And that's the background around which I'm going to, I've gotten some of the top foreign policy thinkers and analysts whom I could find to, to help us figure out what we should do how we should navigate the path forward. And yes, we've had a lot of discussion around what Nehru did right or didn't do right and what Sardar Patel did or may not have done and what he should have and should not have done 60 to 70 years ago. And I'm sure all of those are perfectly valid and legitimate debates and discussions to be having. But we need to take a slight time out and worry a bit about what's happening today at this moment all around us because it's not necessarily very good news. Let me welcome all of our special, very special guests whom we have. Uh, Pavan Varma, former diplomat, ambassador to Bhutan. Great to have you with us. Jyoti Malhotra, the consulting editor, Indian Express. Constantino Xavier, fellow at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. Ambassador Casey uh, Singh, former secretary also, Ministry of External Affairs. Dr. Zoravar uh, Dorat Singh, foreign policy analyst, fellow at the Center for Policy Research. Um, Deepak Tasarthi joining us, somebody who's often been with us talking about all the challenges and the strategic threats that India is facing, and Shashadri Chari. So now you know why I said all the top foreign policy experts that I could think. Um, before I dive into Maldives and Nepal and Bangladesh and all of these things, can I just ask all of you, am I being paranoid out here a little bit about, about China and Chinese influence, or do you think it is... Uh, it's, it's justified to be a little concerned. Pavan Verma. Oh, in my view, China... Bhutan, perhaps the only country which of the list that I named, which is still, for the moment, seems okay. Well, certainly Bhutan, uh, China would love to get a footprint into Bhutan, but that's another matter. Essentially, the point I want to make is that Chinese policy towards India has been crystal clear. And it has been so for quite some time engagement with the containment of India. I don't know if we have a counter policy to China. And certainly, to the extent that I have witnessed it, there is a certain diffidence of dealing with China in the same manner and often in the framework of hostility that it deals with us. 
and I can give examples if you will allow me in the opening statement. For instance, China says citizens from Arunachal Pradesh will get stapled visas. Now, I would expect India then, because if we claim Arunachal to be without question a part of our territory and have, it's a state within the Indian Union. We should have said in that case, all Chinese of Tibetan origin will get a stapled visa. It's the kind of language that China understands. But our response was diffident, it was delayed, it was confused, it was ambiguous, it was ambivalent. China has invested billions of dollars in POK. But China objects to India even looking for oil in South China Sea. Now, POK is declared an internationally disputed area, but right. why have we not protested sufficiently? So, in other words, China's policy to us is clear. The real question is whether we have a strategic framework to deal with China and then separately with our neighbors in the South Asian region. Okay. Jyoti. Bikram, in your introductory comments, you use this word claustrophobia. Is India increasingly getting claustrophobic with China rising in the neighborhood, expanding its influence in the neighborhood? And I would agree with that word. I think India is getting claustrophobic. And in that respect, in that regard, I think that the ongoing crisis in the Maldives, which is a really tiny nation, it has a population of only 400,000 people, mm -hmm. if that, which is perhaps uh, less than where NDTV is located in Greater Kailash, a little colony in Delhi. But I think the reason the Maldives is so important is because it's, it's astride these, um, these shipping lanes, it's uh, astride the equator, and its location is extremely important. A Chinese naval base or two Chinese naval bases in the Maldives would make India absolutely become far more than claustrophobic. Which India is would why, feel suffocated. Absolutely. Which is why I think India must take a, a position on the ongoing crisis in the Maldives, not only because democracy is at stake, which it is, but because it's in India's interest to have a democratic Maldives in its neighborhood which is why the Chinese have already told the Maldivians that they do not want any power, referring to India, to take any strong measures. And that's precisely why if India, if Prime Minister Narendra Modi, who's traveled around the world, positing India as, an, uh, as a regional power in Asia, if you really want to put your money where your mouth is, I think the crisis in the Maldives is a defining moment for India's foreign policy. If you're going to blink right now, if you're going to blink today, then I think it's over. You, then India's can, you, you, there can be a lot of talk about its uh, primary uh, place in the neighborhood, but I think that's all it'll be, talk. Okay, defining moment, this particular uh, crisis, and perhaps also in the question of India-China relationships and how that plays out. Would you agree with that? Okay. Yes, and uh, to answer your question, I don't think you're being paranoid. And actually, even paranoids have real enemies, as you know. So uh, it is a situation which is new in South Asia. And if you exclude Pakistan, and if you think of the Indian government, the Indian state, as going back to, say, 1857, the late 19th century, this is the first time you have an external power penetrating India's exclusive sphere of influence. The Russians tried that during the British period towards the Raj. They failed. Uh, the, China, the Americans have tried during the Cold War, but stayed largely away, say, from issues like in Bangladesh, even the Maldives, Sri Lanka in the 1980s. This is the first time that you have a power from outside the subcontinent actively playing games in India's sphere of influence and dispersing tremendous amounts of investment, which are gaining, which are giving China more and more leverage in Sri Lanka. We've seen the story in Bangladesh. We've seen the president of China announcing $24 billion worth of aid in Nepal, you saw who came to power recently, and the Maldives, as I think Jyoti rightly pointed out, this is a really tipping point for India's ability to explain and, and, and have its China's checkbook control. really, which is buying it influence in these countries, like in Sri Lanka's case, they may not have wanted to, but they got into a debt trap and they had no choice but to hand over Hamban Tota. The, not mm. only that, there are other factors also, but we'll discuss them. Okay, we'll, we'll, we'll come to that. But okay, so you're saying you should be paranoid or India should be paranoid, you know, it, 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 sometimes paranoia is a good thing. And it should do something about it. And it should do something about it. Vikram, it's, it's not a new threat. China has been playing, intruding into the region since 1963. Uh, under the Kennedy uh, administration's pressure, we had started talking to Pakistan after 62 war, and suddenly China and Pakistan had a border agreement. Sakshram Valley was ceded by Pakistan to China and that started the nexus between China and Pakistan. So they've been very much there since the 60s, 
since Bhutto reached out to them. All that has happened is that since 2013 and the rise of President Xi Jinping, they've become more assertive in South China Sea, East China Sea, Indian Ocean, India's periphery. But otherwise, the pressure has been there. But remember one thing, India's always had, this is not new, it's got nothing to do with the size of the chests of the Indian leaders. India's had a Monroe Doctrine. Monroe Doctrine was when Americans said, no European power will intervene in Latin America. We put Tribhuvan on, back on the throne in Nepal in the 1950s. We annexed Sikkim, which was a buffer between us and China. We threw out the Portuguese from Goa. We intervened in Sri Lanka, although tragically, with tragic results. We created two parts of Pakistan when we liberated Bangladesh. So India has always taken care of the periphery. We've so had a red line. You're going to do something in the Maldives so now, right now, that's why when we went in 88 in Maldives, it's high time we went now, but I wouldn't blame just the present government. The problem started in 2012 when GMR was thrown, or rather 2011, when President Nasheed was dragged out of the uh, uh, out of the presidential palace, and literally you had a coup at gunpoint. Uh, that government, UPA government, did nothing. Then GMR was thrown away, thrown out and of uh, Maldives. Nasheed saying that you need to intervene. And we'll be that is from. when. That, that's why I said on another program, a stitch in time saves nine. If it intervened, then the Chinese were not on the horizon then. But in the last two years, Xi's been there, uh, Yameen has been to China, Chinese submarines are there. So there are many options which we had till 2012, which we may not have today. All right, Zorabar, let me yeah. get everyone's initial take and then we'll dive sure, into sure. the Maldives crisis so, in greater so detail. So it's not new. We have been dealing with external powers right from the 1950s. Let's not forget the 1954 US-Pakistan alliance, which shaped the balance of power, which we still live with today. China added to that, as Ambassador Singh has said, in the 60s. And today, we actually are facing an environment that has pre-existed this government, but they've now inherited a changing balance of power. And, and sadly, I think it's fair to say, as uh, Jyoti said, that uh, this is not the first time we've been blinking. We've been blinking for the last decade. Uh, but, but Zara, but, you know, and you know, we have been sort of retreating Zara, from you, the, the neighborhood the to some extent. The present government can always say, Ki, yes. look, things went bad in the past. The UPA did X, Y, yes. Z wrong. Nehru should have done this in 1950. Yeah. So and so should have done in 1960. All of it may be perfectly true, but at the end of the day, right now we are in 2018, Absolutely. and the government of the day is the government of the day, and the government of the day has to do something and today. And, no point beating our chest one, about what could have been done. And one could add even more so because they have come out into the open and projected Indian leadership for the last several years, and the concept of leading power, for instance. Now, what does that mean in practice? So. And that's okay. something where, where they will be, and they ought to be held uh, uh, sort of to question that what is your concept of regional order? And, okay. I, and, and I would say that India, there's no doubt that India has been retreating from the region for the last 15 years, and now it's time. And, you're and, doesn't, and, and I'm not, by the way, advocating an intervention in Maldives. This is not the time or maybe the place for a military intervention, but what is the role okay. that you what want to play in South Asia? The question I'm about to turn to, should yeah. it be military yeah. intervention? Should it be something else? Should it be just refusing to meet their envoy? Is that in any way you know, a positive step or not. Shashadri Chari, let me throw that, throw that broader question to you. Um, India's place in the world is first of all defined by India's place in the neighborhood. As we look around our neighborhood, there seems to be increasing Chinese encroachment into this space. And I'm using the word encroachment, you know, in, in, in a certain sense of the way I was referring to claustrophobia a little earlier. There was a hope four or five years ago that India was really making a lot of very good common ground with all of its neighbors and they would be with India first. They may still say it, but Chinese influence is rising and rising and we don't seem to be able to do anything about it. This is not the first time again that something is happening in Maldives. So the government is taking steps. But if you expect the government to come, to come on television channel and then give a minute to minute uh, recount of what exactly what is happening, don't expect that. I think the government is aware of this, just as the earlier governments were aware, this government is also aware of it. Something is happening and the situation will be brought under control. It is not that India is just not uh, doing anything. New Delhi is aware of it and things are being sorted out. But we have to wait and look at the situation and then carefully calibrate our reaction. Wait and watch policies don't always work very well. We tried wait and watch in Nepal for a very long period of time during the blockade. Didn't work and it set the seeds for certain negative trends that are being manifested perhaps more, more now than ever before. Ji Parthasarthi, last but by no means the least, your sense of, 
would you agree to what we were perhaps referring to as, as claustrophobia with increasing Chinese influence? And is this perhaps the number one foreign policy threat uh, that India and the Indian government and all of us should turn our attention to? We remain fixated about Pakistan and, you know, line of, of, of control incursion, which we must. Obviously, we should look at that. But is this something else that should really be dominating our discourse and something we should be worrying about? I don't think we should uh, get into the politics of which government did what. I've been long enough in Indian foreign policy to know, yes, there's a difference in style, but generally substance and uh, continues uh, because national interests don't change. So, yes, the UPA government did quite a bit, taking into account the dangers posed by a rising China. But we have to remember something. Never before in recent history has the asymmetry of economic and military power between India and China been so great as it is now. And hats off to the Chinese for the pace in which they have developed over the last 15 to 20 years. Having said that, I think uh, we, we are, in our own way, uh, moving both diplomatically and militarily to deal with the situation. Uh, diplomatically, for example, uh, we've, we have found that the Chinese uh, expansionism has led to quarrels with almost every ASEAN member state. The getting the ASEAN leaders together was not here just for a cup, to Republic Day was not just for a cup of tea. Uh, we are moving closer to countries like Indonesia, Philippines, Vietnam in developing a balance of power to our east. And most importantly, the important uh, balancer would be Japan, with whom relations are very close. Uh, to, our, uh, to our west, we are the only country in the world with good relations with all major powers to our west, including um, uh, the, uh, all the Gulf countries, Saudi Arabia, Iraq, Iran, uh, you name it, Egypt, uh, uh, and Israel. So let's be, let's be very clear. Let's not uh, involve in this sheer self-flagellation about how badly or we are. Yes, things are, getting, are changing, but you have to live with change. Now, dealing with that change, as I said, we ourselves don't have the economic or military power to balance China alone. But its own behavior is helping us to get partners. Okay. Let's not forget another point. There is certainly the Belt Road Initiative, which includes the maritime silk route through the Indian Ocean and yeah. the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor. It does surround and, surround and make us feel difficult. But this is just a continuation. I mean, learn to uh, deal with the asymmetry of Indian and Chinese power, which is now much greater than before. Get your defense strengthened, which I'm not very sure we're doing very well. But add, add, add to balances external and internal within the region. Okay, fine. We've, we've got basically some, some, some idea of, of from, from everyone as to what should be done. Now let's throw it open. Let's start off with the Maldives, for example. Now, obviously, it is a matter of 15 minutes, perhaps, for India to be able to intervene in a military manner or any other manner in the Maldives, should it want to. Is it a good idea? Is it a bad idea? China very clearly saying it's an internal matter of the Maldivians. Leave it to them. What should India do in the Maldives? Who wants to go first? You know, in my view, uh, we can't make an automatic comparison with what happened in 1988 and the situation today. Even They're not comparable because in that case, the government of the day asked right. for intervention. In and fact, here, uh, you are almost moving in with the I still remember change. I'd gone to Maldives the day after the coup when once things were in control with a contingent of the media, and yeah. I was there for those three days. I don't think those situations are comparable. Now, I'm also not privy to what the government knows and what communications it has opened and what it plans to do. All I can say is I'm not entirely clear as to why we said no to the envoy. And I'll put my, uh, my, my argument right in the beginning so others can react to it. You see, a gentleman is never unintentionally rude. If we had, if the government of the day is sending an envoy and sending that envoy first to India, even if we have problems with that government, even if it is to convey to that envoy what problems we have with that government, right? do we need to close the door when they go to China and to Saudi Arabia or, and to Pakistan? I think yeah. that's the question we need so, to ask ourselves. Okay, before Secondly, I get an answer... 
So before I get an answer to that and throw it to everyone, we did ask actually the, the Maldives ambassador to India, Ahmed Mohammed, spoke to NDTV just a day back. We asked him that entire question, why we send those envoys to you know, China and Pakistan and Saudi Arabia and not to India. This is what he had to say to, to NDTV. We follow the India First policy and we are very serious about uh, the India First policy and sensitive to it. Uh, therefore, we made that request yesterday. There is growing influence uh, of, uh, of China as a perceived perspective. Then India should play that role. India should uh, reach out to Maldives more often. Mr. Imtia, uh, uh, th thanks so much for being with us. What sort of a... We, we've heard Mohammed Nasheed and others asking for Indian intervention, including military intervention. Is that, do you think, the right course of action right now? What would you like to see India doing? Maldives is in a crisis, certainly, at the very moment as we, we speak. Uh, President Yamin has uh, declared state of emergency, and uh, uh, he's running amok against all opposition MPs and even Supreme Court justices. Uh, all the institutions are sabotaged by the president. The uh, parliament is padlocked, and uh, there's uh, no institution functioning at the moment. So... Uh, like always, we always seek Indian assistance in such circumstances. India has always been a knight in shining armor. Um, uh, we have seen a um, water crisis in the Maldives. India came first to our rescue. We have seen uh, a very terrible crisis back in 1988. India came to our rescue first. And it is again time for India to take a very, very important or crucial action against the Maldives regime. And uh, whatever means that is suitable to use, India should come to our rescue. Sir, I, I guess the question that will come in right now is, we've already seen countries like China and others saying that it's an internal matter of the Maldives. If India does intervene, will it be seen as interfering in the internal affairs of another country? Because unlike 1988, the government of the day is not making a request for intervention. Well, um, uh, state sovereignty is no longer privileged over human rights, as you know. Uh, if the state, if state proves unable or unwilling to protect citizens or itself becomes the perpetrators of violence against its own citizens, it is uh, uh, a responsibility of the international community and uh, more specifically India uh, is uh, very much expected uh, to come to the Maldives to our rescue. Um, uh, China... Uh, I think uh, China issue is a, is a big issue at the moment in in, in Maldives. Um, uh, there has been a free trade agreement between China and the Maldives, and uh, like you have heard of, uh, uh, we are now in a death trap uh, with China. So um, China may be speaking uh, as they speak, but uh, India is is our closest neighbor, the biggest democracy uh, around. So India has to take a very, very solid action against the Maldives regime. So, so just asking one last question. Sometimes when you, in, when, like for example, when India did inter, in, intervene in, in Sri Lanka, there was a lasting bitterness. Let's say India was to intervene and then, you know, move out after that. Would there be lasting bitterness? Would people feel that India did something which was wrong in the long term? The entire Maldives is seeking Indian assistance. The entire Maldives is calling and appealing to India to come to a rescue. Uh, there's no support for, for the current regime. So nobody likes this government and nobody likes what President Yamin has been doing. Um, you have heard of uh, the, uh, the president has sacked two of his vice presidents, two of his defense ministers in jail, two uh, commissioners of police being sacked, two Supreme Court justices in jail. Uh, Supreme Court has been occupied. Parliament has been padlocked twice. Uh, in five-year terms, um, a state of emergency has been declared. All political opponents are jailed. So there is no no way that anybody can say there is support for the, uh, the to the ruling regime. So the entire population, the entire Maldives, everyone is calling for uh, Indian assistance. All right. Uh, uh, thank you so much for joining us with that perspective. It, it was great, uh, great talking to you. Perhaps not all of the Maldives, almost by definition, because obviously, you know, the, the president and the people who are close to it. So it's it's tricky this time. Right, it's not right. 1988. So, 1988 so, so was I, a I think it's quite obvious, listening to both parties, 
that they uh, they they wanting India to sort of luring it into playing a role in an internal dispute. Now the question here is: Hang on, hang on. The government no, side is slightly different. The government side is yeah. very clear I, which I think, side it's. Yeah. It might be it might be unfair to say it, but they seem to be. You know more tilting on the Chinese side. They said, but we are always willing to do. See, the, I think that I think the New Delhi has, for the moment, taken a correct position. They did not need to receive that envoy because the moment you receive that, you legitimize that regime because it was going to be a fait accompli. So you're right now standing back. I, I don't think that is no, the president. Some, he is the president of Maldives. No one's questioning yeah, that. Yeah, but, but to he's some he's extent, you, involved, yeah, you don't legitimize the situation. I just, don't agree with that. Can I just make no, a? No. So what I, you're saying, they should have received the envoy. In my view. In my view, if uh, India was the first choice, even for the current government, with who, of whom we may be critical, and examining other options, if the envoy was coming first to India by abdicating a role in the whole matter and letting the envoy go to China or Saudi Arabia and they Pakistan, sent, I don't know if it's a well thought out so policy. They were not, they were not sending the envoy no. to ask for Indian advice. They have, they are going all around. To sort of legitimize but what they've done internally, the which is question. a complete breakdown of their the constitution. They're not going all around. They've basically gone to China. Pakistan, we know what position Pakistan will take. Saudi Arabia <laughs> is tricky, and that's why external affairs minister is there. She may have had a pre existing visit, but we need to get Saudis on board because Pakistan will go running to OIC and say an Islamic country has been invaded by India. So once Saudis are on board, PM will be in Emirates tomorrow or day after, and he has already spoken to President Trump. So once we got the big boys in the Islamic world and U.S. on board, I think there is a you can make a good case in international law. This is an illegitimate regime. They illegitimately overthrew the previous president. They locked up half the other power players, including President Gayoom, who was president for 20 years and is the half brother of the president. If he was that confident and he had people with him, he wouldn't be locking up people. He would be letting them come and would it be seen present would themselves? Would international law view this in your yeah. view? See, I mean, a lot of people are calling for a military intervention, and I think it's the easy way out. There's a lot of political incentives for this prime minister to take that as a big action, but I think it's the last resort which India should take. Three quick points. First point is I've studied, you know, a lot of these involvement from India in Nepal and Sri Lanka the last 50 years. There's a pattern there. And I can tell you one thing very clearly is that when these neighboring countries cut off communication channels with Delhi, Delhi goes into a hostile mode. And this is what we've seen. Once the Maldivian government, the president, makes an announcement saying we're going to send special envoys to three friendly countries and does not include India, that's a loss of face for India. And that's clearly going to activate alarm bells here. But the that's second issue just damage control by saying that we would have first sent him no, no, to you, India if you, you receive him. a special envoy with certain guarantees that President Yameen is going to have a democratic reset. He's going to give a roadmap which is favorable and agreeable to India. Obviously, he's trying to save face and sending, I'm sending a special envoy so I can tell the international community India is with me. Now, India is not going to work, play the game. Well, Vikram, Second, if we had cogitated so, so, like this, we wouldn't have an ex-Sikkim. You know, when there's power play in your immediate periphery, there is no scope for vacillation. You don't bring quasi morality into it. This is politics and power play. Yeah. Either let's, you're let's a major also, power or you're not a power. Let's the also remember that Nasheed. Listen, the Chinese, Chinese will soon, Chinese will soon yeah. have a base Sikkim there. Has a certain relationship Once the Chinese, let's also remember Nasheed like, opened the door to China. Let's not Maldives. forget no, that no, Sikkim no, was hosting a China streams in the Maldives, even if it goes You will get a Chinese base there. Just allow me to finish my. Once you get a Chinese. the consequences. May I just finish my point, Once you get a Chinese base. China shop. About China, but don't be a bull in the China shop. Yeah. Can I just get Shashadri Chari in very quickly on this and uh, and Parth Mr. Parthasari? Shashadri Chari, I know you are saying you have no idea what the government is doing, and for all we know, the government is planning something. Uh, is masterful in action the best thing to do right now? Or as you heard what the Maldives opposition MP <laughs> just, just said, we, we, uh, Mohammed Nasheed has been saying it openly India needs to intervene and India needs to intervene now. I, I, I think it's, it's all right for them to say that India should intervene. Uh, but it's basically a political issue there and we already have a Maldivian ambassador in New Delhi and uh, our foreign office is in constant touch with that ambassador. So it would be, you know, it would, we cannot overlook the powers and uh, uh, you may, be in, touch with the ambassador. You may the be in touch with the ambassador. The ambassador is saying you should have received the envoy. The ambassador was saying you should have received the envoy and had a conversation with him. In touch. 
We are constantly in touch with ambassadors. ambassadors. I think and I, I, think, I think we should go by what he advises. <laughs> A. Oh, B. Hang on, hang on. Hang on. You are saying you should come over. Some and you are saying, comes over. Mr. Chari, hang on, hang on. Had, Mr. Chari, one second. I'm trying to understand we what you're saying. Informed. You're saying India should we be guided informed. in its. You're saying listen, that India. Listen, listen, listen. One minute, one minute. Let me complete my sentence. We had informed the Maldivian and envoy that. The, the the prime minister is not available the foreign office people are not available the foreign minister is not available but we know of the situation and we are in touch with your ambassador so it is not that we he was not received but but if he expects that the moment he lands he should straight drive into the prime minister's office and then say what this government wants to say i think such things don't 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 happen in, in diplomacy Mr. Parthasarthi, I mean, we've heard some radically different views. We all agreed on the question of China being the biggest area to, to, to worry about, but we're not quite agreeing on what should be done in the Maldives right now. Vikram, I was one of the three people the whole day with the Prime Minister when the action to intervene in Maldives was taken. Yeah, the we persons we were taking show. on not were me. not Maldivians. They were Sri Lankan mercenaries in the, rec in the pay of some rich Maldivian. Yeah. Not that, again, we didn't do it for democracy. Gayum was no great democrat. But we certainly didn't want, want a bunch of hoodlums taking over an island so close to us uh, that too at that point in time. Now, coming to the present. You see, right, right now, as I see it, the major players apart from us are China and, and Saudi Arabia. Uh, Pakistan is a factor being brought in by Maldives primarily to demonstrate to us that they have an option which has no maritime capability or air capability to intervene there. So uh, the fact of the, ma the, fact of the mat matter is, my understanding is that the key player is going to be, or the turning, turning, turning point will come to Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia has been funding them a lot, but the Mol uh, Yamin has been playing with the wrong princes. The princes whom he was playing with are under arrest. Let's see how Prince Salman plays this out. After all, when they spoke about Maldives today, the, uh, yesterday, when the, our Prime Minister and, uh, and uh, President Trump knew that Saudi Arabia would remain a key player, our air relations are improving and the Saudis are not likely to say no to the Americans. So let's see how this plays out mm. diplomatically because depending on China alone, can cause trouble. And if it is dependent on I mean, China we, alone, if we are starting then off, let's see how the other, other so, factors play out. So if we don't, are starting yeah, off... Don't, the, don't rush into something stupid. Yeah. It's, okay. only, it's only fools who rush in where angels fear to tread. Okay. Fools rushing in where angels fear and to tread. Now, hang on. Two, 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 yeah. two overall premises yeah. in this. Number one, if we, we, we hear what all of you are saying, wait, watch take systematic action and don't rush into something is, is one thought that I'm, that I'm hearing. And the second is, be prepared for the fact that you will not have a consensus with China. In fact, perhaps we should be guided by the fact that if China wants us to do something, the opposite may well be the right way to go. Would you agree with both of those? See, you, we have limited leverage right now, non-military leverage on this regime. Who has make maximum financial leverage apart from the Chinese? I would say the Saudi Arabians and the Americans and the banking system where all the regime sort of wealth lies. You should leverage that for a multilateral approach and also let put, let put, them, uh, put their money where their mouth is. I'm talking of the United States. If it truly is interested in this Indo-Pacific maritime security harmony between India and the United States, then why should we be firing a gun off their gun off our shoulder with the Chinese? Let them come on board. And let it be a is collaborative it, is it, process. Is it a, a right, right case? Yeah. Is this the first case where India should say, all right, we, we are aspiring to global leadership. We had the prime minister Absolutely. going to Davos and saying India aspires to be one of the global leaders. Really, there's no other country which has influence. No, if Maldives is the, if, if Maldives is the country where India cannot play the decisive role, where will India be playing a decisive role? I think, role? Vikram, you have to also remember what happened in 1971. It took India nine or ten months. It took then Prime Minister Indira Gandhi nine or ten months to intervene in Bangladesh and then East Pakistan. And I think you, you have two, to... The two <laughs> cases are absolutely different. not comparable. Yeah. I'll tell the, you why they are. The Kerala I'll Coast Guard could properly intervene in the Maldives if it wanted well, to. It's not like invading no, so East therefore, Pakistan. It's therefore, it's well, the therefore, if the Kerala Coast Guard... The is is the Kerala, if, the Kerala, if the Kerala Coast Guard can sail by the Maldives or within quotes intervene in the Maldives, I don't think you even need to do that. If that's what they can do, 
then why hasn't India done it yet? But I think it's much more complicated than that. Obviously, this is your backyard. So therefore, India has to be the lead player in marshalling the international community. You've had Prime Minister Modi has spoken to President Trump. And as the Americans have themselves said, India and the US are the bookends of the Indo-Pacific. If we indeed are the bookends <coughs> of the Indo-Pacific and the Maldives is astride the Indo-Pacific, then India has to play the lead in marshalling the international, international community to do the following. I would say the first thing you have to do is to impose sanctions. You have to tell Yamin, the uh, current president of the Maldives, that if you don't roll back your emergency and bring democracy, you have arrested an 80-year-old former president, uh, Mamun Gayoom. If these people are not let out of jail, if you don't, the Supreme Court Chief Justice is, has been arrested, if these things are not done, then there will be sanctions. And, how, and what kind of sanctions? Remember that Nasheed, besides asking for India to intervene, has also said to the Americans that you have to stop all financial transactions. I think that's going to be a really big move. Americans will, if they, if they do that, if you're going to impose travel sanctions, for example, these three envoys who went to Pakistan, Saudi Arabia, and China, suppose you, they were to, there are other officials who come to India, who come to other parts of the world, including the US. What if you were to say, sorry, they can't come to the US or to Saudi Arabia and, other, and to the European Union? I think you have to gesture diplomatically first. You have to impose okay. sanctions. Military intervention Pavan is, is a looking, last resort. Pavan is not looking convinced, but let me yeah. just get your view in first. Yeah, well, let me do three quick points. First one is don't underestimate what the Indian government is already doing in the Maldives and may be behind what's happening in the Koreas. The people in the diplomacy and intelligence work very hard to be prepared to cultivate assets, to be on the ground working to protect India's interests. So that's the first point, this idea that India's reacting and doesn't know, wait and watch. I'm not so sure that's what's actually happening as these hours go by. Number two, presidents will come and go, Nasheed, Gayoom's, Yamin's, but they will keep getting closer to China. This is in the DNA of smaller countries to balance, to bring in China to get more benefits from India. So you can waste a lot of diplomatic intelligence, boots on the ground if you want military power to be in there, but then Nasheed is saying he's a great friend of India now, but he was, like Zorovar mentioned before, one of the first ones to open the door to China. So that in the long term It happened after Raja Paksa as well. Last point, he last point. You're asking what we should do, what India should be doing. Presidents will come and go, but the capacity to deliver more economic assistance, tie these countries closer to India, that's what's important. That's when the Maldives the signs an FTA, when the Maldives signs an FTA with China and India denies them the ability, says you shouldn't be, I ask myself, why isn't India offering a better FTA to the Maldives? So, okay, let me come back then. Let me, let, let's start tying up the threads. Mm -hmm. Maldives, uh, an illustration of what we should or should not be doing vis-a-vis the Chinese question, as when we were having a similar debate with Nepal. So let me try and get all of you to, to look at this. At the end of the day, if it is India's goal to keep the Chinese slightly further away, Out. what's the best way to do it? Is it by saying, if you are used, if you are giving Chinese a base here, we're going to intervene, we're going to do something, we're going to punish you, we're going to have sanctions. Is it, as he says, offer them better deals to talk them in? Is I it, think, as, as Partha was hinting, go into the Chinese backyard and, and, and start pulling, tweaking their tail there. Not your question, Vikram. I think it has to be a multi-tiered policy. First, you must have a strategic framework to deal with China in a manner that is befitting for a country like India, which also believes that it is an emerging superpower. In mm -hmm. other words, this docility and diffidence needs to go. China is building the China-Pakistan economic corridor through territory which we claim as our own, and we actually have some voices in India which say we should attend the conference in Beijing about this road. You, Dalai Lama comes anywhere in the world to any part and China protests. Yeah. He can't go to Arunachal Pradesh without a rude protest note from China. And yeah. here we have a totally wishy-washy policy to China. That is one. Second, we need to build up our military infrastructure along the border because that matters as an element in diplomacy. Third is... How, what kind of relations do we have with our neighbors? There's an old Chinese saying, why do you hate me? I have not helped you. And when India as a big country kicks in with in relations with smaller countries, hmm. there is a certain nuanced role that you've got to play. The sentiment too far wide along our borders with the smaller neighbors we have is that often India believes that it's a divinely ordained right 
to interfere in its internal affairs. With the exception, but that's a problem with intervening in Maldives, yeah, right? Because the, that, with, that, that gets with the exception of Pakistan, where I believe our covert intrusion into Pakistan should increase, and in any manner that we can, we need to deal with a country that will remain implacably hostile with us. But and with other countries, more finesse, better economic relations, more persuasion, greater respect for sovereignty. All right. These are factors that need to go so, into play. So but deal in a certain manner with countries that are implacably hostile to you is what Pavan Varma said. So Mr. Parthasarthi, let me throw it to you. As we are dealing, whether we are dealing with Maldives or Sri Lanka or Bangladesh or Nepal or any other country, Pakistan also, should we be dealing with that in the context of what is perhaps implacable hostility towards India or at least a desire to contain India from the Chinese? Now, I was struck earlier, you know, I, I got this, this tweet sent to me by somebody when I was asking about the Maldives and what we should be doing. Chinese are not our enemies, he said. We can call them our competitors. Our enemies are within in the form of Congresses and communists, but, you know, leave the last part aside. But the entire question of whether we should be viewing China as a strategic threat or a strategic enemy and viewing our actions in the light of that, what would be your take, Mr. Parthasarthi? Then I'll throw that to Mr. Chari. I would view China as a strategic challenge to be dealt with by in multifarious ways. Yes, China will have its influence uh, on our uh, on the Indian Ocean, and I would like us and the Japanese and others to have equal influence on the South China Sea. So, work with partners to develop a situation where you retain your influence, and this this region cannot be dominated by China. The one exception, and I agree with Pawan is going to be Pakistan, and that needs separate, special, and rather stronger treatment. Yeah, and that we, that we have discussed at great time. Mr. Chari, are we somewhat in, or some segments, are we somewhat in denial uh, about China? I mean, forget about Chinese influence in terms of string of pearls and coming into the Maldives and coming into Nepal. Even Chinese influence in the Indian economy, you know, look at the amount of our telecommunication infrastructure or communication infrastructure that is today in Chinese hands. We don't seem to be doing anything about it. 60 to 70 percent of online news in India is controlled in one way or the other by the Chinese. We don't seem to be particularly concerned about that. I mean, any other country by now would have been panicking and ringing alarm bells. We seem to be quite okay with that. News information is being controlled by China. We've been watching no, it. We no, haven't no, no, done no. anything about it. Yeah, Mr. Chari? No, it's not. No, no, it's not that we have not done anything. Uh, I'm, 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 much, I'm sorry, I don't agree with Pawan Verma on this issue. Of course, I, I, I a, a, the relationship partisan. between India and China, the, the India and China's relationship is very asymmetrical, no doubt about it. But China has been doing it for the last almost three decades. Yes, so, we have just started now. But as far as our economic engagement is concerned, I think we have been very strongly pursuing the cause of ASEAN. We are very strong as far as BIMSTEC is concerned. We have revived all our activities as far as BIMSTEC is concerned. And BIMSTEC is one uh, regional architecture where China and Pakistan both are not involved. And also we should remember that these 13 or 14 choke points in the Indian Ocean region is a security threat not only for India, but it is also a security threat for Indo-Pacific area and also the US. Remember, US is in Djibouti, uh, US is in Diego Garcia, China is in Djibouti, they are building a very big uh, port there. And in, in that connection, we should view what is happening in Maldives. Between Somalia and the Malacca Strait, Maldives is the only island which can give some sort of a base for those people who are operating in which this why, area. Which Therefore, is why, which is why the Maldives broad, is so crucial. Broad geopolitical situation. You're absolutely right. That's why the Maldives is so crucial. It occupies very important strategic real estate right there in the middle of the Indian Ocean. So does Seychelles, by the way, which is a country which I'm glad India is finally reaching out to and trying to we sign an agreement to before somebody also. does that. So is the Mauritius. All of these countries, along with the Andaman and Nicobar Islands, will be crucial in control of the Indian Ocean. <coughs> and we need to turn our attention to it. Right. Implacable long-term hostility to China is something we need to deal with. See, look, if we are going to set up our entire foreign policy based on China, then we're setting ourselves up for serious disappointment <laughs> and failure. I would agree. We okay. need to look at the subcontinent in our own terms, based on our historical civilization linkages, and also accept the reality that our neighbors want ties with China, with the West, 
they must respect certain red lines. What those red lines are need to be debated carefully. You can't have an all expansive veto over everything they do, but let's say they want development, they want uh, trading relationships, commercial relationships with East Asia. What's wrong with that? We should be confident enough to allow them Offering to grow. China naval bases. Yes, so those are red lines. That's where you draw the line and you have significant leverage and unused power which can always be wielded. But you have to ask yourself, you have to ask yourself why these countries are being offered naval bases by China. After all, if, the, if Bangladesh is buying two submarines from China, you have to ask yourself why India and Bangladesh, which have been so close for the last 45 years, why is Bangladesh buying two submarines from China? What is it going to do with those two submarines? I think the fact is that, the in, that India promises so much to its neighbors, whether it's Nepal, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, and doesn't deliver. So in a sense, the, these countries are also saying that while we have this ancient historical civilizational yes. ties with India, which is this enormous 800 pound gorilla in the region, we also must have options and we must have alternatives like the Chinese. That's why Xi Jinping, when he comes to Bangladesh, he cuts a check of $26 billion. He can afford to do that. The Indians can't afford to do it. But then we have to do other things. Our trade with Bangladesh is abysmal. And we, and we uh, somehow can't seem to get our trade policy right. All right. So, I mean, that, what Jyoti rightly said, that's one of the problems we're always going to face in this region, that India simply can't write the sort of checks that China can. It may be argued, and by the way, again, Prime Minister Modi said this at Davos, that when India does trade or when India is doing deals, it's not tying people into a debt trap. The obvious implicit illusion was to China. But is that a problem, that India case can't write the sort of checks that China can? It can't, and that's a capacity problem, which I think Ambassador Varma no, mentioned too, that you don't have the assets, the financial assets, but you have other ways of leveraging your influence in these countries. And I think, I mean, the Chinese are busy uh, trying to plan a railway connection into Nepal across five, 6,000 meters altitude mountains. India doesn't have currently a passenger rail link to Nepal. So there's a lot which needs to be done. I think this government has put the emphasis on connectivity neighborhood first very rightly, but it needs to deliver more, better, faster and quicker in Just partnership, in partnership yeah. with many other countries which can work together with Just India. Just hydropower with Nepal, if we can work out an agreement, is, is uh, worth, uh, will, will bring the two countries closer in an enduring economic relationship beyond so, cultural ties. So don't worry if you can't write the checks, no. be smart about it. There are many Master. things which you can't do. I remember I'd gone with the, the president then uh, in the 80s to Nepal and the Nepalese king then said, we don't want any dams because the only arable land they have will get submerged. So there's a problem there. Look, there's strategic okay, confusion. Right. Now here. they're selling the we dams to, deal, to China. We have to deal with each country, each neighbor differently. I thought we were going to discuss Maldives. Now Maldives, you have to deal differently. It's not a normal government. It's a government which has thrown out a president who was friendly towards India. It's taken a number of inimical steps. It's passed a free trade agreement overnight in the parliament. It's locked up its uh, two judges. Now this is, Henry Kissinger says, large countries are not looking for love. They're looking for respect. Now if you want respect, you have to make an example of Maldives and say these are red lines. You already crossed them. Normal sanctions will not work. I'll tell you why. Because if the Chinese, a couple of Chinese ships show up there, are you going to then take on the Chinese? You have to move very rapidly yeah. to get this guy out. And this has to be done rapidly. If you waste time, the Chinese will show up there. And then it becomes an India-China confrontation and nobody will touch them. They may have a submarine surface there about or an island which they have taken over. Then the Chinese become a party to the dispute. At the moment they are not, we have enough moral leverage available. You have two presidents jailed. You have chief justice jailed. I'm sorry, right to protect is a developing international concept. European countries have intervened, others intervene, Americans intervene all the time. Honduras, this, that, they go in and intervene. Who's going to stop you? But how? But that's why if they, you it's have... It's a very simple. How you do US, it is not something we can discuss. No, no, no. Just one last word. Last word. Let me tell you, I have it on absolute authority. In 2012, the Navy had already positioned three ships. When this guy was thrown out and GMR was getting thrown out, there's no signal from Delhi. There is no. enough capability. You, no, no, nobody has, nobody the doubts capability. the capability. Yeah, no one doubts the capability, capability of doing something you know, in the Maldives. Yeah, it's a question of whether you should. I'll make a point it's here. the will to do it. That's it's, all. Uh, we should have been far more carefully watching in a proactive manner the situation involving over the last two years, <laughs> which I think many people would say the straws were all uh, going in one direction, yeah. that this is going to be a crisis. Okay. Now we should have prepared ourselves better for it. 
But in the absence of that, or if we haven't done it sufficiently well, believing that you have the right to walk into a country and comparing it to 1988, where you were invited no, no, to do so you by the president of the new concept, I don't yeah. think. I, I think, think we should. We should. We should wait for right other to, options. Yeah. Right you don't prepare. need to walk so, in. Yeah. It's a new so concept. So at the end of their show, yeah. walk in and intervene and do it now before the Chinese get in. Don't walk in and find more smart ways of handling the situation. So you know, I'm sorry. <laughs> Government of India, we haven't really come and told you exactly what we should do, although we have all the foreign policy experts, but that's why you're the government and we are just here to, to talk and advise and suggest and at one thing certainly state and lay out, it is time to take all of these things really seriously because whatever happened in the past or history, this is here, this is now and we've got to worry about what is happening, especially in our neighborhood and we have to come up with the right answers and we have to do it fast. Well, hopefully we will find answers to this by the time the next episode of The Big Fight rolls out because <laughs> we are out of time. Thanks a lot for watching. Bye from all of us.